this morning. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Can I have some little bit more lights? I like to look at the people I'm preaching at. Give me some lights. Yeah, I, uh, I did that to keep Pastor Mitch safe because we go to some bad places. We go where there's some real unsavory people and there's lots of crime. And so uh, that's why, you know, wanted to keep you safe. That's why you're here today. <laughs> Praise God. And of course, Britta is with me. Today we have been married today, exactly 39 years today. <laughs> Praise God. Lucky girl. <laughs> I'm just, I'm one lucky guy. 39 years she has put up with me. Praise God. We have a good marriage because I'm gone so much. You know, <laughs> gone about half the time. So she says you're good, but in small doses. So <laughs> praise God, praise God. I want to start by showing you some pictures uh, from our uh, latest crusades. Okay, this is Africa, India. Now, uh, let me, this is, now I'll tell you when to flip to the next picture. This is from Mafambise in Mozambique. And, uh, you know, this is in an area where it's 40% Muslim. And we have been focusing on the Muslim areas of Mozambique. In fact, two of our crusades this year, we did in, we did in an area that was almost 100% Muslim. Very, I mean, hardly any Christians there. So anyway, the next picture, please. Uh, this, is, uh, a, this is from that crusade. A lady who was blind and crippled, received her sight and walked. Uh, next picture. Now, th these pictures are from the past 12 months or so, from the past one year. Uh, we have compiled them. A mother with a daughter born deaf who received a hearing. And the next one, these are people getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the next one, uh, this is Apostle Lazaro who founded the Assemblies of God in Mozambique 57 years ago. In fact, almost all the pastors in that region had been saved under his ministry. Uh, tremendous man of God. And uh, I don't know how old he is. I called him Apostle Methuselah. He's, <laughs> You know, so, so anyway, the next picture is, this is in Munyava, another place in Mozambique on Sunday night. And the next one, uh, this is a school of ministry for pastors. And the next one, this is a little girl who was blind, who received perfect sight. She was about nine years old, born blind, received her sight. And the next one, uh, this is, I believe this is in Mafambisa in Mozambique. And the next one, this is in Chawama. Gospel Crusade, Zambia. Now, this is very interesting because in this meeting, this was the final night, and uh, I always pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on the last night when the Holy Ghost came, I mean, it was amazing. When the Holy Ghost came upon the crowd, two things happened. The first was thousands of people began to speak in other tongues. And at the same time, uh, 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 you know, in Africa, they have these bats that are small. African bats are small. But this was a bat-like creature with about a five or six foot wingspan. And all those people saw it. And they said it had a human face and was covered with black bristles. And when the Holy Ghost came, this thing flew out of the crowd. Nobody knows where it came from. Because the people who were standing there didn't know where it came from. It just flew up from out of the crowd and flew straight out of the place like a bat out of hell. So. Uh, so, you know, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than the power of the devil. We always have to remember that. Amen. Uh, and the next one is, uh, this girl was completely blind for five years, but received her sight. And the next one, this, she couldn't stand up on her own, but had to be picked up, carried around, and now she was running. Uh, and the gentleman on the chair, uh, incidentally, you know, the one with the glasses, He's the great-grandson of famous Pentecostal evangelist Smith Wigglesworth. He's a, a, a close friend of mine. Got a great church in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the next one is, uh, this is in Manga in Mozambique. Uh, a town, I mean, the, this field was way outside, in the outskirts of town. And there was no public transportation, no buses, nothing. And, uh, but, but people came because God was moving and people came. We started, I think we started with about uh, four or 500 people the first night. And on the fourth night, we had more than 60,000 people. So this was on the fourth night. And the next one, 
is uh, this is this is that same night, but this is on the side of the platform. Uh, people waiting to testify that they have been healed. These are just the people who were healed that night. So then the next one is this man. He was crippled and unable to walk for years, and he got healed in that crusade. The next one. Uh, this uh, this uh, girl, woman, lady had not been able to walk for seven years, but she could walk and dance after Jesus healed her. And the next one, uh, this is in Chipata, uh, Zambia. Now, this, this place uh, was very high crime, terrible place. Uh, the first few nights, people were, you know, they were just carrying on mayhem while I was preaching there. It was terrible. I was so angry, I wanted to close down the meeting after two nights. But the Lord told me to keep on preaching, so I kept on preaching, and then towards the end of the week, we really had a breakthrough. And on the last night, we had thousands baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the next one, uh, this uh, girl was born mute and spoke for the first time in her life in that crusade in Chipata. And the next one, uh, now this is in Burma, and uh, uh, the, these are Buddhist monks, and they're 13 years old. You know, they, they take them as little babies, and bring them up in monasteries. The interesting thing about this picture was that the first night there was a Buddhist monk who was deaf who received his hearing. So he went back to the monastery and said, hey, there's these Christians praying for the sick and, you know, and my ears got open. So they had two more deaf monks and they sent both of them and they both received their hearing that night. So, so anyway, then the next one is, this is in, in Asia. I, I can't, I'm not at liberty to mentioned the place, but this is a place where uh, Christians were persecuted, they burnt many churches, killed many Christians, and we went in there and did a crusade there. So, and the next one is, this is a man who was totally paralyzed and lame for many years and was carried in to the crusade. They lay him down on the field and the power of God touched him. He got up and began to walk. This is in that crusade. And the next one, uh, this is one night, I think two or three crippled people got up and walked. And the lady with the, uh, with the burgundy shawl in her head, on her head was one of them. And the next one, uh, this is also in Asia. And uh, I'm not at liberty to tell, to tell you where it is. This is in an area, there's an insurgency going on there. Small town, but God really moved. And we had huge, huge, huge numbers of people come out. Uh, to receive Jesus. I've never seen so many miracles as I saw in this place. And I'm actually going back to this region. Uh, I'm leaving two days after Thanksgiving, six days from now, next Saturday. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And the next one, uh, this is, uh, we were protected by armed uh, military or police. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, when we were there because of the guerrillas operating there. And the next one, uh, this is a lady who was paralyzed who began to walk from that crusade. And the next one, uh, this man was born deaf and mute, uh, about 45 years old, received his hearing and his speech. And the next one, now this is the last picture. Now keep this on. I'll tell you what happened. On the last night, we, I mean, uh, the first three nights, the Lord did so many things. On the last night, people rented ambulances and, 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 and you know, people drove from six to eight hours away. Uh, bringing sick and crippled people with them. So we had a whole section with people who were, who, you know, who were brought on stretchers, on beds, who, you know, it was, there were like a lot of people like that. So on the last night, uh, uh, many people were saved, people were healed. That photo was from the last night, the, the huge crowd. So I took testimonies from people who had been healed, and I took testimonies for over an hour, and then I got tired, and I just closed the meeting, told everyone to go home. I was sitting in a tent they had in the back, sitting, drinking some tea. Then I heard people shouting, praising God, shouting hallelujah. So uh, I asked what was happening, and somebody went out and took pictures, and he took this one picture that, uh, I mean, the rest of the pictures were fuzzy, but this one picture, this man was one of those who had been carried in uh, on, a, on a stretcher or a bed, and he got up and walked. And then what happened, I got a... I got a, a a video on WhatsApp, um, this came to me last week, from my interpreter in those meetings, and he was saying, he says, for two hours after we had finished the meeting, the power of God kept on moving in the, uh, you know, in the, in the section where all the stretchers, and there were two hospitals that had been emptied of patients. 
because they brought all the patients there. So this is his testimony and uh, a lot of people were healed. So uh, I'm going back to that region and there actually this area, there are very, very few Christians. So uh, I'm, I'm going, as I said, in, in six days time next Saturday for two campaigns there. The first crusade will be in an area where there's less than 100 nominal Christians in the entire region. And nominal Christian means people like uh, Catholics, you know, who, who, who don't, you know, like traditional Christians uh, who, who are not really born again. So there's about only 100 people like that in the entire region that where we'll be, uh, where I'll be preaching. So uh, we are expecting God to move there. So that'll be the first crusade. Then the second crusade will be in, in another area where there's, there's more than a hundred, but there's also very, very few nominal Christians. So my team is there preparing right now, and it's a very, very unreached area. Uh, they have never had a gospel outreach there. There's very, very few churches. So that's where I'm going to. So please remember us in prayer. Amen. So this will be our last two crusades of the year. And this year we were planning to do 12 crusades, but we could only do 11 because one got canceled because of uh, situations with the government, we had to cancel that. But this will be our uh, 10th and 11th crusades this, this year. And uh, I'm starting again next year with Argentina in January. And then February, I'm going to Asia again, this same country, but in another area. And then uh, I'm, you know, I'll be busy. I'll be doing about 13 crusades next year. So praise God. Thank you, Pastor Mitch, for having me. I'm honored and blessed. Amen. Praise God. Um, let, me, let, let me share something simple with you uh, this morning, but let's stand up and pray together. Amen. Father, we come to your holy presence in the name of your son, Jesus. We honor you. We glorify you. Lord Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you, Lord, that when you were, done, you were crucified, you bore upon yourself our sins and our diseases. And by your stripes we have been healed. You have chosen to call us that we may bear much fruit, that you be glorified. And this morning I ask you to reach down and touch each one of us at the point of need in our lives. Lord Jesus, we honor you, we bless your name, we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Praise God. Praise God. I want to share with you something very simple. Let's go to John chapter 3. Let's go to John chapter 3. Now, you remember this is the story of when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night and Jesus began to talk to Nicodemus. And this is one of the things he said to Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verse, John chapter 3, verse 14. And he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Now, Jesus was talking to Moses, uh, I'm sorry, to Nicodemus about a story that Nicodemus was very familiar with. Nicodemus, as you know, was a, uh, was a Jewish priest, so he was very well uh, versed in the Old Testament scriptures and he knew all the stories in the Old Testament. So Jesus is telling him of a story that uh, is actually reminding him of something and telling him the true meaning of this story. Because see, in the Old Testament you have all these stories, but to fully understand these stories you have to look at Christ because everything in the Old Testament uh, actually points to Jesus. These are types and shadows of who Christ is. So this story that Jesus is relating to Nicodemus took place 2,000 years before Jesus in the days of Moses, right? So this is a 2,000-year-old story that Nicodemus knew about. So he says, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... In the same way, I shall be lifted up. Now, how this story goes is this. If you look at the history of the people of Israel, 
Uh, the people of Israel, uh, you know, their, their story went around and around and around in cycles. Uh, God would bless them and they would worship God and they would praise God and there'd be abundance and there'd be prosperity and there'd be victory. Everything would go well. And after some time, they would get complacent and they would get lukewarm and then they would backslide and fall into sin. And they would, when they would fall into sin, curses would come upon them. Interestingly, uh, in Deuteronomy 28, it talks to us about, the, it tells us about the blessings of, of obeying God and the curses that come from, from uh, turning away from God and not obeying his word. And the curses, I want to tell you about the curses, are the curse of poverty, the curse of disease, and the curse of death. That's the three four, uh, threefold curse of disobedience to the word of God. The curse of poverty, the curse of sickness and disease, and the curse of death. Now, we have to be very, very clear about what the blessings are and what the curses are, because James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above. The Bible tells us clearly that God is a good God and he's, he gives only good things and there's no shadow of turning in him, right? But then we live in a fallen world where we also have other things that are not necessarily good. And, uh, you know, that are, you have got sickness, you've got, you, 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 you've got a lot of bad things that happen to people. And, uh, and the reason bad things happen is we don't always know. Sometimes, of course, it happens because people live in sin. But that is not true in, in most cases. In most cases, the fact is that we live in a fallen world. And because we live in a fallen world, there are bad things around us. And things can happen to us even if we don't want them to. And, uh, but the best way to win victory over, over these bad things is to know, is what you know. It's what you know that helps you overcome. Amen. The prophet Hosea in chapter 4 verse 6, he said, My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Many good people uh, suffer unnecessary suffering not because of any fault on their own of their own not because they have sinned but they suffer because of lack of knowledge because traditionally religion and churches you know because we we see the problem of of uh, bad things happening to good people so somehow we want to accommodate these things in the christian life so we tell them you know we live in this world and this is the way it is. Sometimes God makes you sick because he wants to teach you something. And, you know, there's a will and a purpose with everything. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that. That, uh, you, know, now, you know, that kind of belief that everything good or bad comes from heaven, comes from God with a purpose. You know what that is? That is called fatalism. Fatalism is when you believe in fate. That's what it is. You know, it was predestined to be so. That's the way it is now. I was a Muslim, and Muslims are fatalists. And when I see Christians who are fatalists, I really don't see any difference between them and, and Muslims when it comes to this, you know, uh, type of belief. Because, they, because the, the main problem with people who believe this is that they have not take, fully taken into account what Jesus has done for us upon the cross. We must take into account what Jesus has done for us upon the cross and have faith in what he has done for us upon the cross and not only have faith in it, but fully embrace it by faith and personally, not just in a, in a, in, in a broader general theological term, but personally embrace it that this is what Jesus Christ has done for me upon the cross because the very fact is that the Bible says that it is so. And if the Bible says it is so, it is so for me. Amen. And the Bible tells us that surely he has borne our diseases and he has carried our pains. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes, we have been healed. 
So anything that Jesus has taken for us upon the cross, we should never sit back and accept it as a part of our destiny, but we should fight it, fight the fight of faith and overcome it. Amen. Now, I don't know how I wandered off into that territory, but that was not my point. My point is this, that it says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. So, as I said, the children of Israel, their life went in circles and they would be blessed and then the curses would, you know, they would fall into sin and when they would fall into sin, the Bible says the curse does not come causeless. The curses would come on them because of their sin, poverty, sickness, and death. And then they would suffer. And the Bible tells us how they would sow and their Malachites would come and reap. You know, they, I mean, everything they sowed, somebody else would reap and so on and so forth. There were destruction and all that. And this would, then they would turn around and they'd say, this is happening to us because we have turned away from God. And they would do the right thing. They would repent. And, you know, they would repent and turn to God. When they would turn to God, everything would be okay again. God would bless them and they would praise him and they would serve God and God would prosper them and bless them. And soon their hearts would get complacent and cold and, you know, again. And then they'd fall into sin. They'd some, sometimes they'd begin to worship idols. And then, of course, the curses would come and then they would suffer. And then after some time, they would and turn back to God. Then God would bless them again. It's when, if you study the people of Israel, that's the way it was. It went around in circles. But now, what happened was that the children of Israel were in a place called Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is actually east of the River Jordan uh, in the country of Jordan. They have built a monument there. You see, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a sculpture there of a pole with a serpent on it on the mountain. And this is where the story took place. The, the children of Israel were on Mount Nebo in the wilderness. And they were going through one of those uh, periods when they were living in sin. They were, burn, you know, worshiping idols and they were totally backslidden. And one day, the curse came over them in an unusual fashion. It was not poverty. It was not disease. But suddenly out from the middle of nowhere, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of snakes came and began to bite the people. Can you imagine? Now, snakes are a, I hate snakes, okay? Let me, now, I have eaten snake in, it's delicious if you, if it's done right. Snake soup is good, fried soup is good. I've eaten cobras, I've eaten banded crates and vipers, I've eaten rattlesnakes, you know. Now, snakes are good eating, but I don't like them live. I prefer them cooked and on my plate or a snake soup, right? Now, but, but snake bite is a terrible way to die. Ter it's a terrible, uh, when a person gets snake bite, it's a, um, usually it's, it's a slow and very painful way to die. So all these snakes came from the middle of nowhere and they began to bite the people. And here you had tens of thousands of Israelites. They were on the ground screaming and writhing in agony. Everywhere you looked, you saw these Israelites. Either they were being bitten by snakes or they were, they were on the ground writhing and screaming in agony. And then somebody had the presence of mind to say, this is happening because we have sinned against God. And then somebody else said, let's find Moses. Because he talks to God and God talks to him. It was interesting because up to that point, they had basically ignored Moses. You know, uh, they just basically sidelined him, ignored him. But, they, but now when they needed a man of God, you know, that, that's what people do in the world even today. You know, they live as they want to. And then when they get into trouble, they look for a man of God. Somebody who has a hotline with God. Somebody who can talk to God on their behalf. Right? Or if someone dies, they want a pastor who they have never been to his church, but they want him to come and speak at the funeral. Right? They want a Christian burial, thinking that this might help, this might compensate. Then when they bury him, they always put a cross over the grave. 
I know what makes people think that somehow if they have a Christian funeral or a cross over the grave, it would help. But anyway, they said that let's find Moses because Moses talks to God and God talks to Moses. So they went to Moses and they told Moses what was happening, that the people were dying because of snake bites. So Moses, he understood immediately what had happened. So Moses goes before God. And you know, Moses was a, uh, was a very kind and a very tender-hearted person. And we see this again and again, how he would plead with God for the people when the people sin. And he said, oh God, these are your people. I know, you know, they have sinned, but they are your people. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. So God told Moses, he said, okay, Moses, this is what you do. Take some copper. Now, pure copper is very soft. It's pliable by hand. He said, take some copper and fashion a serpent, a snake of copper, and you nail that copper serpent to a pole. Then you take that pole and run with that copper serpent on that pole right in the, to the middle of the camp, and then you raise up that pole with the copper serpent and tell the people to look at that copper serpent. And everybody who looks at that copper serpent, his sins will be forgiven, the curse shall be broken, he will be healed, he shall not die, but he shall live. This is what God told Moses. So Moses quickly, he took some copper, made a copper serpent, and he nailed it to a pole, and he ran to the middle of the camp with the pole and lifted up the copper serpent, and he told the people, this is your deliverance. Look at this copper serpent. And the Bible says, as, the, as these people who were dying this slow and painful death, Thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people, as they were dying, they turned around and looked at that copper serpent. And everybody who looked at that copper serpent that day experienced a wonderful miracle. It happened to all of them without exception. Nobody was left out. Their sins were forgiven. The curse was broken. The, the poison that's of the snake bite, the poison, the venom that was in their system, it was neutralized, it was destroyed. And they were healed. And they did not die, but they lived. This was a, I, I should say numerically speaking, other than the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea, this was the second biggest miracle numerically speaking, in the entire Old Testament. So now Jesus is referring to that story. And he's telling Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you remember that story when Moses lifted up that copper serpent in the wilderness that day. In the same way, I am going to be nailed to a cross and I shall be lifted up. So that whosoever puts his faith in me his sins shall be forgiven. The curses upon his life shall be broken. His diseases shall be healed. And he shall not die. And he shall be healed. Now this was before the cross. And we know that this is exactly what happened. That when Jesus died upon the cross, he bore upon himself all of our sins. So that we don't have to carry those sins or bear the consequences of our sins. I've heard people say, yeah, but you know, there's a law of sowing and reaping and if you have sown bad seed, even if Jesus has forgiven your sins, you still have to bear the consequences. That is not true. That is religious stuff. That's not New Testament. I have sown many bad seeds in my life. But I'm not going to bear the consequences. You know why? Because Jesus, he bore not only my sins, but he also bore the consequences of my sin. The fruit that came out of my misdeeds. Jesus bore them. Hallelujah. That is why. You and I, we can walk free with a clean conscience before God. Hallelujah. That is something that Jesus has done for us. And he bore all of our sins. 
Psalms 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins. All your sins. No matter what it is that you have done. It doesn't say that, uh, you know, sometimes the human mind is such, we can easily think that, well, God, uh, I know this little stuff I've done, but those bigger things. Mm -mm. The, are you saying that the blood of Jesus isn't powerful enough to handle our big sins? The blood of Jesus is so powerful. When it says it cleanses us from all our sins, that means from our smallest misdeeds, or I should say in legal language, from our smallest misdemeanors to our biggest felonies. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember that song, It Is Well, It Is Well With My Soul? There's a beautiful verse there. Most of us, we don't think of it. It says, my sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. What a glorious thought, that my sin, not just in part, but the whole, all of my sins were nailed to the cross, so that I don't have to bear it anymore. That is what happened upon the cross. That's the first thing. He bore all of our sins. Secondly, why Jesus is like the copper serpent is that Jesus bore all those curses that should have been rightly come upon us. Galatians 3 says that Jesus, he became a curse for us. When he was upon that cross, he was cursed. The curses that were upon us came upon him. He was cursed and the father turned his face away from him. And he even cried out. He said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? He was cursed and he was forsaken by God and by man. He became a curse for us. So that you and I don't have to be cursed. Another thing that religion does, it tells you, you got curses on you because your great-grandmother was a witch. Yeah, but I didn't know her. Doesn't matter. It's still upon you. And it all stems from one verse of scripture. You remember the scripture in the Old Testament? It's in, found in two places. It talks about, for I, the Lord, am, your, am a jealous God and I will visit Right? The sins upon the fathers, of the fathers on the children. And that's what it is. But if you read the whole verse, that's only the half of the verse. The whole verse says, but showing mercy to them that love me. That means, yes, there are generational curses, but they, are, they come only upon those who don't love Jesus. Because those who love Jesus, they're exempt from it. That's what it says. If you read the whole verse, it makes it very clear. Amen. There is no blanket generational curses because look, if you look at my family, if I look, take a look up my family tree, it is scary. <laughs> I've got all, I don't know about your family tree, but none of us has a lily white family tree. Right? If, if I look up my trees, there's plenty of monkeys sitting up there. Now you're laughing, your family is that way too. Right? And then people say that, well, you have to confess the sins of your father. How will I confess their sins when I don't even know what they did? Nobody has kept any record. I was never given a record of, you know, the people before me and they said, these are their sins. I want you to get on your knees and start confessing. I don't know what they were. All I know is this, yes, it's not just their sin, but my sins in themselves are bad enough. 
but I know that Jesus was nailed to the cross and he became a curse for me. And because I have given my life to Jesus and he lives in my, in my life, I'm no longer cursed, but I'm blessed. Hallelujah. That's what all I, that's all I understand. But here's the fact. The fact is, there's a scripture which says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's really what you believe. If you believe, you know, if you have let people convince you through their teaching, preaching, or books that you have a curse on your life, then you will believe that you have a curse in your life. And if you believe it, that's the way you will experience it. That's the way it will be for you. And you, you'll have lots of proof. You will say, Christopher Alam, all that you are teaching is too positive. It's not true because I do have these curses. No, it's not because it should be that way. It is because that's what you have chosen to believe. That's why it's so important that we choose to believe the right thing. We choose to believe what the Bible teaches and not what religion teaches or what people say. It's so important that we, we, if we find out from the scripture, what does the Bible say? And we believe that, hallelujah. And we speak that with our mouth and say, I'm no longer cursed, but I'm blessed. <laughs> hallelujah, amen. Because if you look at the weaknesses of your flesh, you will have all kinds of evidence to prove that you have all kinds of demons living in you and you've got all kinds of curses because none of us is perfect. And it's an easy way, easy scapegoat. You blame all your problems on the presence of demons on curses upon your life and you can spend the rest of your life rebuking and breaking those curses and casting things out of yourself, but, but they are not there. It's just the fact. The problem is you believe they're there when they're not there. So go to see what Jesus has done. Hallelujah. So that's what happened when those people looked at the copper serpent. First of all, their sins were forgiven. Secondly, the curses were broken. The third thing that happened to them was that they were dying of snake bite and they were healed. Now, that's what Jesus did for us upon the cross. The Bible says that surely... Isaiah 53 verse 4, surely, and the word surely means without doubt. That means there's no ambiguity about it, there's no discussion about it, it is just the way it is. Without any doubt, he has borne our physical diseases and he has carried our pains and by the stripes that were put upon his back, the, by, the, by the whipping he endured at the whipping post, we have been healed. Hallelujah. And that's what I choose to believe. Even through sickness, I choose to believe that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Even when I'm sick, I always say that. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Because I've learned that I should never say what my circumstances dictate to me. But I should say what the Bible says about me because the Bible always trumps your circumstances. The Bible can change your circumstances. Amen. That is the gospel. So they were healed and they did not die and they lived. They were dying and they lived. And for us, it means we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. I was reading an article by Pastor Stanley Schoberry. He's an old pastor in Sweden. I know him for like over 40 years. And uh, this gentleman, he's in his 80s now. And um, he said something interesting. He says, you know, he, you know, he's Swedish, living in Sweden, in Stockholm. And he said that we in the Western world, we live with this instinct of self-preservation. And because of this instinct of self-preservation, we do not dare do a lot of things that uh, call for extraordinary boldness, especially when it comes to risking your life. So he said he was somewhere in uh, northern Pakistan and the Taliban was in the area. And, uh, and he went there to preach and he was riding in a jeep with some Pakistani pastors and he says, and they told us that the, that the Taliban guerrillas are all around, just be very careful. So he says, I was frightened. He said, I was frightened until one of the Pakistani pastors looked at me and he says, pastor, why are you afraid? He said, well, because, you know, he says, pastor, 
I preach here all the time. And I'm safe. But you know, even if a bullet did hit me, you know what would happen? The next second, I'll be in heaven in the presence of Jesus. He says, even the worst thing that they could do to me is the best thing that could ever happen to me. Now think of it. Now you might think that is foolish, but that's the American way of thinking. Because we, that instinct of self-preservation is so important to us. And, 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 and that's why we don't want to put our lives in danger, not in foolishness, but the sake of the gospel. I'm not suggesting that you, you know, you do a bungee jump without a cord because you have faith. I mean, people do all kinds of stupid things, you know. I, I see Christians do all kinds of daredevil, stupid thing, risking their life for nothing, yet they're afraid to go on a missions field, on the missions field because they might get killed. I mean, just think of it. What can they do for us? And, and, and Jesus said, he says, do not fear that which can kill your body, but not kill your soul. Do not fear those things because if you want to see the power of God, if you want to see the blessings of God, that is where those things are. And you've got to remember that, that we have eternal life. Hallelujah. I'm not going to die. I'm immortal. And that which you call physical death, that is just a doorway into something much more glorious. And when that time comes, it's, I'm ready to go. But of course, I don't want to throw my life away. I want to give my life away. But I don't want to throw it away. You throw your life away by doing something foolish, by doing something stupid. But give my life away. I will gladly give it to Jesus. I'll give it for the gospel. And yet at the same time, I understand that when I am in the will of God, in the purpose of God, doesn't matter how dangerous it is, that is the safest place for me to be in. Hallelujah. Are you with me? So now Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so I shall be lifted up. That whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life because God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, here's the difference between Jesus and the copper serpent. Jesus was given because God so loved the world. That copper serpent was only for the people of Israel. That's the first difference. That copper serpent was only for that you know, for the people of Israel. God didn't say to Moses, this is for all mankind. He says, this is for those people who have bitten by, been bitten by snakes, for those Israelites. Those, that copper serpent was for the Israelites, but Jesus is for the whole world. Amen. And those of you here who are not of Jewish heritage, we should be thankful because if you and I, I'm not of Jewish heritage, if you're not of Jewish heritage, you could have stared at the copper serpent as much as you wanted, nothing would have happened to you. Because it wasn't for you and me. It was for the Israelites. But Jesus is for everybody. I can go anywhere in the world and preach about Jesus. It doesn't matter whether they're black or white or Chinese or Indians or Arabs or whoever. If they just look at him and put their faith in him, they can be saved. Their curses can be broken. They can be healed and delivered and set free and receive eternal life. That's the first difference between Jesus and the copper serpent. The second, the second difference between Jesus and the copper serpent is that that copper serpent was a one hit wonder, as you would call it. <laughs> it healed people only that once. There's no record of people ever having been healed or delivered or curses broken 
more than one day because history does tell us that the people of Israel, they actually kept the copper serpent and they carried it around because it was, it was like a national flag for them. In fact, that emblem has endured to this day. If you go to any hospital, you know, this happened 4,000 years ago. You can go to any hospital, any pharmacy in the world, and if you look carefully, you will see a sign of a pole with a snake on it. Have you seen that? That has become a symbol of God's covenant of healing. In fact, healing and, 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 and people becoming healthy from sickness and disease, that's that symbol of that pole with that serpent on it. You can go to the worst Islamic countries and their doctors and nurses will be wearing that badge. Nobody ever told them it came from the Bible. Good for them. But that has become a symbol of healing and deliverance and it has endured for 4,000 years. But in these 4,000 years, that copper serpent healed people only that one time. Just once. It never happened again. But Jesus, the Bible says, he's the same yesterday today and forever since he was crucified 2000 years ago every single day since then somewhere in the world people are being saved people are being healed people are being delivered their chains are being broken their sins are being forgiven they're receiving eternal life we hear testimonies all the time hallelujah Jesus is not a one-hit wonder. He's an everlasting savior. He's an everlasting healer. He's an everlasting life giver. He's an everlasting deliverer. He is still the same today. Hallelujah. As he was then, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. His power will never fade. Hallelujah. Amen. The third thing about that copper serpent, you know, what happened to that copper serpent? Do you want to know what happened to that copper serpent? I did some study and I followed it because you don't hear much about it anymore until 1,200 years after Moses. That copper serpent resurfaces again in the days of King Hezekiah. You know what had happened? Because of that one miracle, that one miracle in the days of Moses, the people of Israel that took that copper serpent, it became one of their relics. They carried it around. They kept it at a place of honor for 1,200 years. And then 1,200 years later, by time it go, you know, it was there in King Hezekiah's time, they were actually worshiping that copper serpent. They were burning incense to it. People would come and kneel before that copper serpent and they'd prostrate themselves. They'd, they'd worship that pole with that copper serpent and burn incense before it. It became one of their relics. Until King Hezekiah was a very zealous person when he saw all these people worshiping relics and idols and the copper serpent was one of them, he ordered it to be destroyed and that copper serpent was destroyed, the pole was destroyed, the copper serpent was destroyed and nobody knows what happened, thank God he destroyed it. Now you must have thought, why did he do that? It could have been put in the Bible Museum in Orlando or someplace. Or, was I'm sorry, Washington, D.C. You know, everyone would have come and said, can I touch it? But you know, that's, that's the spirit of religion. The other day I saw uh, the, 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 the photo of a guy. He used to be my pastor. Actually, he was my, one of my closest friends. He went to Bible school with me. 
we went to Bible school to, and, and he had one of the biggest churches in Europe and he was full gospel speaking in tongues, healing the sick and casting out devils. And then I don't know what happened. He becomes a Roman Catholic. Week after he becomes Roman Catholic, I see a picture of him kissing the Pope's ring. Then he writes on his blog that he now worships John Paul II as his personal saint. And the other day, I saw a picture of him on Instagram. And he with some, uh, he's wearing a black suit and a tie. And with six other guys, he's carrying this box. And then he says that, I was so honored to be asked by the cardinal to carry the box containing the relics of Saint Helen of I don't know wherever and this box contains her bones and her bones were visiting Sweden. It's one thing if someone visits Sweden but the bones were visiting, that's what she said, the bones are visiting Sweden and I was honored to, uh, to be asked to carry the box and he was, it was such a great honor for him to carry these stupid bones and then he says, and then he says these bones of these saints are important because these saints are praying for us. That's what religion will do to you. Right? You hold on to things from the past. And you miss the real point. The real point wasn't the copper serpent. But it was Jesus upon the cross. That is the real point. The copper serpent was just a type and a shadow and a symbol. And people, you know, I have friends who go to Israel. They get rebaptized in the river Jordan. If anyone has been rebaptized in the River Jordan, I won't apologize for stepping on your toes. You got your toes in the wrong place. <laughs> but I, there are certain things I don't see the point with. People get rebaptized in River Jordan, or they they go to the Wailing Wall and they have to pray at the Wailing Wall and they feel the presence of God. But my Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Here in State College, Pennsylvania, hallelujah. Here in State College, Pennsylvania, if two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus, he promises that I'm right there in the midst of them, hallelujah. You don't have to go anywhere. Because we are not about holy places or holy relics or bones or sticks or stones that the 1,200 years ago, the Israelites looked at this copper serpent and the whole nation was healed. So this copper serpent is special. We shall carry it around. No, Jesus says that Moses gave the copper serpent. He lifted up the copper serpent, but now in the same way, I shall be lifted up. That whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Beloved, that copper serpent, King Hezekiah, destroyed it because people were worshiping. But Jesus, we know where he is. He's at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says he's interceding for you and for me. In other words, he is praying for you so that you may not fail. Hallelujah. He said to Peter, Peter, I'm going to pray for you and you're not going to fail. And I have good news for you. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, praying for each one of us by name. He's praying for you. He's praying for me so that we may not fail. Doesn't matter what life throws at us. Doesn't matter what the devil throws at us. We are destined to win. We are destined to succeed because we are covered with the blood of Jesus and the greater one lives in us and he is greater than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up so that whosoever believeth in him. Jesus has been lifted up. And I believe in him. And you believe in him. Whosoever believeth in him. His sin shall be forgiven. The curses on his life shall be broken. His diseases shall be healed. And he shall not die. And he shall live. Your sins are forgiven. The curses on your life are broken. 
your diseases are healed and you shall not die but you shall live forever in the presence of God. Nothing can destroy you.